So today's lecture is a final review of the course for this semester. Uh, during the review, I might give some examples and uh, uh, some of the examples might be related to your final exam questions. Uh, on Friday, the TAs will provide two tutorials. Each tutorial is 45 minutes. And during the tutorials, the TAs will uh, talk more about the uh, classical, common or difficult questions and problems associated with your past homework assignments and exam and tests. And hope those will help uh, your preparation for the final exam. So we learned signals and systems in this semester, and our study falls in two categories, a continuous time and discrete time, because we know uh, signals are basically functions over independent variables. Uh, in this class, when we talk about independent variables, by default, we are referring to time, continuous time t or discrete time n. Although later when we learned various transformations, transforms, the independent variables might be frequency omega, might be the complex number s, or the complex number on the unit circle, which is denoted by z. So for both continuous and discrete time signals, we learned a set of uh, operations in the time domain, specifically time reversal, or reflection, time shifting, time scaling. And we learned properties of signals, whether a signal is an even signal or an odd signal, whether a signal is periodic or not. If it is periodic, how to find its uh, fundamental period. Uh, and then we look at some basic signals, including the unit impulse, unit step, and complex exponential signals. To understand complex exponential signals, at the beginning of the term, we had a special class to learn the basics of complex numbers, the representations of complex numbers in the rectangular form or in the polar form by magnitude and angle. And then we'll learn systems. A system is basically a process that, trans that changes an input signal to an output signal. And for both continuous and discrete time signal, uh, systems, we learned a set of properties that a system might have. Memory list, causality, linearity, time invariance, stability, invertibility. And in chapter one, we learned criteria for those properties to hold or not. And those criteria are based on the input output relationship. So the function that describes the relationship between yt and xt or yn and xn. So for chapter one, perhaps the most important issue is the time domain transformation of signals. Let's first look at this example. That's the time domain transformation for a continuous time signal x of t plotted in this figure. The change from x of t to x of minus t is just the time reflection or time reversal. The idea is not difficult, it just, uh, have the signal symmetric over the vertical axis, mirroring it over, in the, over the vertical axis. And then if we change from x of t to x of t minus one, it's a shift of signal to the right by one unit. If it's x of t plus one, then it is a shift to the left by one unit. And time scaling. If we change variable t to t over two, then we are expanding the signal or stretching that signal twice. So by stretching it twice, it means, for example, if this flat, uh, this plat platform starts from one ends at two, then after the expansion it starts at 
two and Z4. On the left hand side, similar. And if we change T to two T, then we are compressing that signal, right? So originally it starts at one and Z2. Now after the compression starts at one half and Z1. We can have a multi-step transformations. For example, if we want to change from X of T to X of one minus T, there are two ways to achieve the result. The first is to first uh, is to make the time reflection first. So from X of T to X of minus T, reflection over the vertical axis. Then we focus on how the time variable T itself changes, right? The minus sign just at this location doesn't change. We change T to T minus one. That's why we have this inner brackets. We only change T to T minus one, which is X of one minus T. By changing T to T minus one, we are shifting the signal to the right by one unit. So originally the signal starts at minus two, now it starts at minus one, shifting to the right. And we may take an alternative route to the same result. We first shift X of T to the left by one unit. So we change from X of T to X of T plus one. And then uh, when we do the reflection, we only change T to minus T, but the plus one does not change. X of minus T plus one is X of one minus T. So it should be the same result. And similarly, if we have a combination of time shift and time compression. We first shift X of T to X of T minus one to the right by one unit. And then we compress it to one half. We only change T to two T. The minus one does not change, but shift it by one half. So the signal is entirely on the right of the origin. So we shift it is still entirely on the right, but the original signal ends at three. Now it ends at three divided by two. That's the meaning of compression. Or we can take an alternative procedure. We first compress X of T to one half, which changes to X of two T. Then we shift it to the right by one half. The two is here at this location. We only focus on the time variable T changes. That's why we have this inner brackets to the right by one half. So minus one half, the result is the same X of two T minus one. Or similarly, if we want to change X of T to X of T divided by two plus one, we can first expand it and then shift it. Or we can first shift it and then stretch it, expand it. But between the two methods, the amount that we shift are, are different. So here we shift by two, but if we shift it first, we only shift by one. I neglect the intermediate procedure, but you can check that these two methods lead to the same result as Paul Oakley below. Or a more complicated problem is a three-step uh, time operation. First, reflection, mirroring it over the vertical axis. Second, shift it to the right by one. So we change T to T minus one. And then we stretch it twice. So Again, one minus, one minus does not change. We only change T to T divided by two. So that's stretching it twice. So from minus one to zero after the stretching, it becomes from minus two to zero. On the right, the triangle starts at one ends at two. Now after stretching starts at two ends at four. So everyone, everything times two. Now we have a time domain operation for discrete time signal as well. We have this discrete time signal X of N where N are the integers. The discrete time signal only takes value at integers. But what is X of one minus two N? So we can first perform the time reflection which flips X of N over the vertical axis. And then we shift it to the right by one. Again, we change N to N minus one. 
don't forget this bracket, which is x of one minus n. After we shift it to the right, you can check that. So we, we can take these five points, for example, one, 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 minus one, and one half. It starts at minus four. After shift to the right, it starts at minus three, right? One, 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 zero, one half, the same pattern, the same pattern for other points as well. And then we change n to two n. We are compressing the signal to one half. For discrete time signals, when we compress it, there will be some points that are lost. So only the original points that are at the odd numbers will be retained. So zero minus one, uh, minus three divided by two minus one, zero. Zero minus three divided by two minus one, zero. And the original points that are at the odd numbers will be lost after we, after we compress it to one half. These points in the red dash circles will be lost. Uh, we are only discussing the compression of discrete time signal most of the time, but not talking about stretching it because after stretching it, there will be some points that have a missing data that need to be filled. Uh, someone asked whether these questions will appear in the final exam. So this final review is just uh, in terms of the important knowledge that I think. Uh, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that those questions or examples reviewed in today's class will definitely appear in the final exam. And uh, some of the questions which appeared in your past exams or uh, homeworks, although not reviewed today, but their variance might also appear in the final exam. So, Right, another question we just for the, it was about the example above. We just ignore the points that are not integer. Right, for discrete time si uh, signals, always remember that the signals should be defined only at integer points. So for x of one minus two n, it is defined for every integer n. Ah, I see, I see what your question is. So your question is whether n should equal one half. Right, it should, it should appear at every integer n. For example, when, we, when n equals zero, we refer the value to x of one minus zero, which is x one. When n equals one, when n equals one, that is where this point should correspond to. But when we want to obtain the value corresponding to this point, we refer to x of one minus two times one, which is x of minus one. X of minus one is, x of minus one takes the value zero. Sorry, sorry, x of minus one takes value zero. X of minus one takes value minus three divided by two. Right? Therefore, for the result signal, when n equals one, it takes the same value minus three divided by two. So overall speaking, the signal only takes value when n itself is an integer. The next issue that I believe is important is the uh, periodic signals. To tell whether a signal is periodic or not, if it is periodic, find its fundamental period. And these kind of uh, questions can apply to both continuous and discrete time signals. For a continuous time signal like this, because it uh, is a sinusoidal function, we know that sinusoidal function itself has period, period two pi, which means for what's inside the brackets, the entire thing changes by two pi, then the signal overlaps with itself. And for T, 
it means when it changes by eight, the entire thing inside the bracket changes by two pi. So the fundamental period of this signal is eight. And if we change from continuous time to discrete time n, the fundamental period is still eight. But for discrete time signal must make sure that its fundamental period is an integer. Eight is an integer. So there is no problem if we say that its fundamental period is eight. But for discrete time signal, even though it's sinusoidal, it may not always be periodic. Look at this example. So we have one over four in here. If we want Xn to be periodic, then by definition, there must be some integer capital N such that X of N plus capital N becomes X of N itself. So N plus capital N, we replace N with N plus capital N. So it is the same signal, but with N divided by four in the, in the brackets. And to make it the same as the original x of n, the n divided by four must be a integer multiplying two pi, which is impossible because any integer multiplying two pi is a so-called irrational number, where the n divided by four, which is the ratio between two integers, is a rational number. So it is impossible for an irrational number to equal a rational number, therefore, this relationship cannot hold for any integer n. X of n is not periodic, or we call it aperiodic. And this result can be extended to the complex exponential signals. So for discrete time signals, complex exponential signal has a magnitude denoted by C magnitude, and it has oscillating part, exponential j omega zero n plus five. Recall that we can expand this exponential using the Euler's formula, which is cosine omega zero n plus five plus j times sine omega zero n plus five. So exponential function is basically a function that behaves similar to the sinusoidal signals. Therefore, for this signal to be periodic, we also require that omega zero times n changes by a multiple of two pi. In other words, there is an integer capital N such that omega zero multiply capital N equals two pi multiply small m, where m is a different integer. And this relationship, if after we simplifying it, because for, for this case, we are given omega zero equals six pi divided by 13. So replace omega zero by six pi divided by 13. And after a series of simplification, what we need is this relationship. And we can eliminate the common factors pi from both sides of the equality. And the minimal n and small m the minimal integers n and small m without common factors are n equals 13, m equals three. And this capital N is the fundamental period for the signal when omega zero equals two pi divided by 13. But for a different case, if you look at case two, omega zero is six divided by 13 without a pi. Then when we try to apply the same condition, what we get is pi equals three n divided by 13 n which is again impossible because pi is a irrational number. But on the right-hand side, it is the ratio between two integers, which is a rational number. Therefore, it is impossible for this relationship to hold because irrational number and rational number cannot equal. And the signal is not periodic, aperiodic. And after we learned the unit impulse signals and unit step signals, which are two fundamental signals. In our uh, problems, we often see this structure, a signal x of t multiplies a function of u or a function of delta. And how to deal with these kind of questions? u of t is the standard unit impulse signal. 
after multiplying it with x of t to the left of zero, everything is eliminated because u of t equals zero. To the right of zero, everything is kept unchanged because u of t equals one. Anything multiplies one is itself. So the result is to the left, everything zero. To the right, everything the same as x of t. And similarly, if we multiply x of t with u of minus t, which is the time reflection of u of t, then to the left of zero, everything does not change. To the right of zero, everything is eliminated to zero. Or we can multiply it with any time shifted and time reflective version of u of t. For example, u of two minus t, we can obtain it first by time reflection of u of t and then shift it to the right by two units. So this is u of two minus t. If we multiply x, uh, actually we multiply x of t plus one, which is this signal with u of two minus t, everything to the left of two does not change. So two is here, everything to the left eight does not change. So the result does not change. Everything to the right eight of two is changed to zero, but it was zero originally anyway. So just zero in the result. What about unit impulse? So for unit impulse, we learned this useful property. Any signal x of t multiplies an impulse that occurs at t zero. So this delta of t minus t zero is a time shifted version of the standard unit impulse. So it occurs at t zero. T zero can be positive, can be negative. But if we have a signal that takes this form after taking its integration, the result is just x of t zero at the point t zero where the impulse occurs. As an example, when this signal x of t multiplies delta of t plus 0.5, taking the integral, then it just takes the value when t equals minus 0.5. So this is minus sign, this is plus sign. Therefore it is minus 0.5 here. What is x of minus 0.5? We can check it on the figure. x of minus 0.5 is one. So two times one plus one square, which is nine. Note that this function takes the same form as what's inside the integral, right? Two times plus one and the square. Don't forget anything. And similarly, if we have t cubic minus one times delta t minus two, then the result is just the same function t cubic minus one where t equals two because two is where the impulse occurs. So two to the power three minus one results seven. And then we move on to chapter two, which is the LTI system, a system that satisfies two particular properties, linear and time invariance. For LTI system, an important concept is its unit impulse response, h of t for continuous time, h of n for discrete time. And this h function is used to calculate output of the LTI system given the input using the new operation we learned in this class called convolution. So continuous time convolution is an integral. Discrete time convolution is an infinite sum. And for LTI system, we also learned a second criteria to tell whether the system satisfies other properties. So since it's LTI already satisfies linear time inverse, but for other four properties, we can tell whether they hold or not from the structure of H of T or H of N. So these are what we learned in chapter two. And for chapter two, the most difficult problem is to calculate continuous time convolution to determine the LTI system response. See, we have LTI system whose unit impulse response H of T is given. And then for input signal X of T, uh, 
determines output y of t. So we first plot a signal that looks like this. It's a difference between two time shifted versions of unit step. So the result is just this uh, rectangular waveform. And x of t from this expression, it is zero everywhere else, but it is a t, which is a straight segment with a slope one between minus one and one. But to calculate the convolution, which is defined here, we need to know x of tau. So we plot it on the tau axis. It's the same shape as x of t. We need to know h of t minus tau. So we know h of tau from the last page. After time reflection, right, it's from one to two. After time reflection, it's from minus two to minus one. We get h of minus tau. What is h of t minus tau? If we plot it on the tau axis, h of t minus tau will be the same square waveform, but with the starting end point shifted by t, regardless of t positive or negative. The start end points are always minus two plus t and minus one plus t. Right. So across the different cases, the start and end points have the same expression. But the exact location of these points will be different according to different ranges of t. For this example, we discuss t over five cases. For each of these five cases, the starting and end points have different relationship with the signal above. And in particular, they have different relationship with the two critical points, minus one and one. As we increase t, the square waveform gradually moves to the right. And the relationship between the square waveform and this street segment also changes across these five cases. So that is the key point when calculating the convolution, when calculating this integration. Or someone asked, it is hard to determine the range of t in each case. Uh, so to determine the range of t, we still look at the expression. Right? For case one, as an example, the square waveform is completely to the left of the, of the slope. Then it is equivalent to say the right boundary point is to the left of the left boundary point of the slope. In other words, minus one plus t is to the left of minus one. Or we can say minus one plus t less than minus one, which gives us t less than zero. So this is how we obtain the range for the first case. But when we move to the second case, our observation is that the square waveform is half on the left of the slope half on the right of the slope. Therefore, minus two plus t should be less than minus one, but a minus one plus t should be larger than minus one. And combining these two relationships, minus t minus two plus t less than minus one, we have t less than minus, uh, t less than one. Minus one plus t larger than minus one, we have t larger than zero. That's why we obtain this range of t less than one, larger than zero. So it's from the relationship of these two points and minus one. The third case, the square waveform completely inside the minus one to one region. The fourth case, the square waveform is half inside the region of minus one, one, half outside of the region, minus one, one. And the fifth case, the square waveform is completely outside the range minus one, one. And for the fifth case, minus two plus t should be larger than one because it's completely outside of it. Then the result is t larger than three. Well, someone asked, can we just look at the figures and calculate the areas? Well, 
it is not even if uh, you are inside a particular case. It might not be straightforward to just calculate the area by looking at the figure. So in this example, for the first and the fifth case, the results are simple because the two, uh, the non-zero parts of the two signals, X and H, do not overlap. So it means if we multiply X and H, in particular X of tau, H of T minus tau, then for case one to five, the result is constantly zero over the entire tau axis. So these two cases are simple. But for the three cases in the middle, the expression of X times H is two times T, uh, two times tau, because the expression of X is tau, the expression of H is two, so it's two times tau. But the starting and the end points of the three cases are different, right? Although the expression is the same, two times tau, the starting end points are different. And for each of these three cases, we need to calculate the integration of two tau for different starting and end points. And this is the part that we need a careful calculation, which might not be available from just observing the figures. And in particular, for the second case, the two tau expression starts at minus one, ends at minus one plus t, because its starting point is determined here. Its end point is determined here. For the third case, both its starting and end points are determined here and here, so in this figure. That's why it starts at minus two plus t ends at minus one plus t. For the fourth case, the starting point of the two tau expression is determined here as minus two plus t, but the end point, end point is determined by a different figure at tau equals one. So it's minus two plus t less than one. Right. So this is uh, the most difficult problem. Uh, I believe not only for the first half of the semester, or it might even be the most difficult for the entire semester. So the continuous time convolution needs some more time for, uh, for training and practice. After we introduce our TI system and the calculation of its response, we learned several different transformations. So the sequence that we learned are from Fourier series to Fourier transform, continuous time, discrete time, to Laplace transform for continuous time and Z transform discrete time. But in this review lecture, let's do it in the reverse order. Are we first look at Laplace and Z transforms because these are the most general cases. For continuous time, we have Laplace transform of continuous time signal X of T, which is this uh, integration. After integration, what is left is the variable S, which is a complex number. And the Laplace transform converges or exists for a particular region S, which is called the region of convergence, ROC. For Laplace transform, we always need to specify not only the expression of a capital X of S, but also the ROC of it. We learned a set of properties of Laplace transform. And in particular, we learned the convolution property, which enables us to calculate our TI system response in a different way. In chapter two, we learned the convolution, which is very difficult. But after we learned Laplace transform, we can calculate everything in the S domain. The output capital Y of S is simply X of S times H of S. So for each S, this multiplication is just the standard multiplication, which is much simpler than the convolution. And then after the, uh, 
then by using the common uh, examples of last class transform, we can determine small y from capital Y. But in this step, one thing we need to pay attention is that even for a system with the same expression of H of S, it might have different ROCs that we need to discuss because different ROCs correspond to different small H of T and it corresponds to different properties of the LTI system, in particular, the causality and the stability properties. Uh, a question from the chat window. Will there be questions asking us to strictly use time domain to do convolution? Well, um, so for the final exam, there should be at least one problem associated with the convolution. So that's why I recommend you to practice with the convolution. And whether it is continuous time or discrete time convolution, I cannot tell you at this point because my purpose is to let you practice both of them. And there is Z transform for discrete time LTI system. Also, the Z transform should have a ROC being specified. It is infinite sum instead of infinite integration. And there are certain properties associated with the Z transform. Again, there is a convolution property that can convert this discrete time convolution to a multiplication on the domain of Z. Again, for a discrete time LTI system, from the region of convergence of capital H of Z, which is the Z transform of small h of n, we can tell the causality stability properties of the LTI system. And by the way, the H of S and H of Z here, we call them the transfer function of an LTI system. And in particular, right, a follow up question to the uh, uh, previous question. Uh, convolution can be calculated in frequency domain. Yes. So if you find for a particular problem that calculating the convolution in the frequency domain is, uh, is simpler, then you can do it in the frequency domain. But uh, for these kind of signals, I would say, if you are familiar with the time domain method, then uh, it will be easier to calculate in time domain than rather than to convert everything to frequency domain first and that then convert it back. Right? It's, uh, it's your own preference. As long as your result is, is, is uh, uh, correct, you will get the points. So for example, for the continuous time LTI system, the uh, suppose we are given its transfer function capital H of S, we can tell whether the system is causal by looking at the structure of ROC. In particular, when ROC is to the right of the rightmost pole, then the system is causal. A prerequisite is that H of S is a rational function of S, which means it is a poly, it's a ratio between two polynomials of S. And if the ROC of H contains the vertical axis, real part of S equals zero, then the LTI system is also stable. That is for the continuous time LTI system. For discrete time, have a similar result, but the structure of ROC is different from the continuous time. For stability, when the ROC of capital H contains the unit circle, so magnitude of Z equals one denotes the unit circle, when the ROC contains the unit circle, the LTI system is stable. 
And when the ROC has the structure that it is outside of a circle, including plus infinity, then the system is causal. And this can be used in combination with what we learned in chapter two. In chapter two, what we learned is the structure of H of N. For example, when H of N is completely to the right of zero, the system is causal. And after learning Z transform, we can relate everything together. Causality, structure of small H of N, structure of the ROC of capital H. And here for the uh, continuous time, LTI system and its Laplace transform. Here is a, a classic example. So we are given the transfer function capital H of S of a Laplace transform, which is a rational function, ratio between two polynomials. We are often asked what is the small h of t, the unit impulse response of the LTI system. And to calculate small h of t, a common technique that we applied is called partial fraction expansion. So we have first order polynomial on the numerator, second order polynomial on the denominator. What we do is to split this at two parts. Each part has a first order polynomial on the denominator. But to determine the coefficients capital A and B for each part, we need this partial fraction expansion. Basically to merge them back and to, I, to identify the coefficients expressed in A and B with the given coefficients, which give us a set of equalities from which we can solve for A and B. And we can express H of S in the equivalent form, but it's simpler. And from this H of S, using the linearity, we can determine small h corresponding to each of the two terms. But that needs the discussion of ROC. Right. When ROC is to the left of the leftmost pole. So there are two poles, minus four and three. Each of the poles will make the denominator zero. If the ROC is to the left of the leftmost pole, then both parts correspond to left-sided signal. The result H of T is left-sided, right? both parts left-sided. When the ROC is a stripe, between the two poles. Then for the first part, it's a right-sided signal. For the second part, it's a left-sided signal. When the ROC is to the right of the rightmost pole three, then both parts are right-sided signal. Right, we can see both part of H are right-sided. And we can also tell different LTI system property for different ROCs. For the first case, the ROC is to the left. Therefore, it is not causal. The ROC does not contain the imaginary axis. Therefore, the Fourier transform does not exist and the system is not stable, so not causal, not stable. For the second case, when the ROC is a stripe, it is not causal. But since the ROC contains the uh, vertical axis, the system is stable. So not causal, but is stable. For the third case, when the ROC is to the right, it satisfies the condition for causality. So the system is causal, but this ROC does not contain the imaginary axis. So the system is not stable. So for the third case, it is causal, but not stable. Then we consider special cases of Laplace transform where the ROC contains the imaginary axis. In that case, we can consider a special case where S equals J omega because J omega is the uh, imaginary axis or in other words, the axis where real part of S equals zero. Replace S with J omega replace S with J omega, what we obtain is the continuous time Fourier transform. Similarly for the Z transform in discrete time, 
when the ROC of Z transform contains the union circle, we can replace Z with exponential J omega because exponential J omega itself is a complex number. Its magnitude is one, so it falls on the unit circle. Its angle changes over omega. Replace Z with exponential J omega, replace Z with exponential J omega. What we obtained is a discrete time Fourier transform. So either in discrete, both in discrete time and uh, continuous time, the Fourier transforms are special cases of Laplace transform and Z transform respectively. Okay, let's have a break at this point. Uh, come back at 12.30, there will be an online course and teaching evaluation. I believe the department has sent the relevant links to you. So from 12.30 and 12.45, I will give you 45 minutes to do the uh, online uh, CTE. Okay, let's resume the lecture. Uh, so for both continuous time and discrete time, we also introduced the inverse Fourier transform. For both, the inverse Fourier transform is integration over omega because uh, even for discrete time, is a Fourier transform is to the continuous frequency domain omega. That's why both have integration, but the integration are over different uh, regions. For continuous time, the integration is from minus infinity to plus infinity. For discrete time, it is for any interval with length two pi. And I explained the reason we will learn the chapter discrete time Fourier transform. Uh, we. There are also inverse Laplace transform and the inverse Z transform, which uh, I do not teach because uh, for the Laplace transform, the integration is not for a single real variable omega. It is for the complex variable S that requires the integration over a certain path on the complex plane. And similarly for the Z transform, the integration not only, not only for a single real variable omega, but for a complex variable Z, it also requires integration over a path. Uh, that is beyond the scope of our, our study. And for both continuous time, discrete time, Fourier transforms, there are a set of properties that are similar to Laplace transform and Z transform. Those properties will help the calculation of Fourier transforms more conveniently when the original signal was operated over time. And the important applications of a Fourier transform is due to the LTI system. It just generalizes this equation, capital Y equals capital X times capital H from S to J omega for continuous time, from Z to exponential J omega for discrete time. And for that, let's look at two examples. The first example is for the continuous time Fourier transform and its application to the LTI system. Uh, for the first example, what we have is the input and the output of the LTI system. And from this input output, we can first calculate the capital H of J omega called the frequency response of the LTI system. How to calculate that? We perform the Fourier transform of both the output and the input. Now for this kind of exponential, for this kind of single-sided exponential signals, we have a uh, previous result that we can directly use. And the Fourier transform of this signal only exists when it is positive. When A is negative, the Fourier transform does not exist. We need to uh, turn to the generalized Laplace transform. And the Fourier transform are, are rational functions of J omega, and we can merge the uh, numerator and denominator respectively, obtain a 
ratio between two polynomials of j omega. This is capital H of j omega. Capital H is the Fourier transform of small h. And to calculate small h from capital H, we again need the technique partial fraction expansion, right? Split capital H as two terms. Each term is a simpler first order polynomial on the numerator and calculate A and B by solving this set of uh, linear equations. And H of J omega written in these two terms, the first term corresponds to exponential minus T, second term corresponds to exponential minus three T times step signal U of T. This is small h. We can further calculate the input output relationship between this capital H. Uh, this relationship can always be expressed in the form of a differential equation. Uh, from this capital H, we know it is capital Y divided by capital X. Therefore, we can multiply the numerator and the denominator on both sides, obtain this quality associated with the capital Y and the capital X. Then applying this differentiation property, so dk dtk is Fourier transform is original Fourier transform multiplies j omega to the power k. So j omega to the power two corresponds to in the time domain d square dt square, small y. And this is a uh, differential equation associated with input small x, output small y in the time domain. So this is an example for the continuous time Fourier transform and its application to LTI system. In this example, we start from input output, calculate capital H and small h, and then we calculate, we, we determine the differential equation. But this procedure can also be reversed by starting with a differential equation or a difference equation if you're looking at discrete time. So for the discrete time signal, let's look at a different given condition. We are given the difference equation. And then how to calculate capital H from this difference equation. Again, we can apply the property of Fourier transform. So for discrete time, we apply the time shift property. Y of n minus one is Fourier transform is original Fourier transform capital Y multiplies additional exponential minus J omega. If it is minus two and multiplies exponential minus two J omega. Therefore we obtain a equ equation associated with capital X and capital Y. In discrete time, still capital H equals capital Y divided by capital X, which is a rational function of exponential minus J omega. And we can factorize the denominator and then split capital H using the partial fraction expansion. Write it as two parts, calculating coefficients A equals four, B equals minus two. This is the same capital H obtained above by written in a simpler form. The purpose we write it in this form is to directly apply the previous result. So for a Fourier transform, for a discrete time Fourier transform that takes this form, its corresponding time domain signal is exponential series over discrete time n times u of n. Applying linearity, we can also get h of n in two terms, by each term corresponding to each term in the capital H. And then we are given a new input, x of n, how to calculate its output. Uh, we can first perform Fourier transform of the given input, small x. The Fourier transform is capital X. For delta of n, we know that its Fourier transform is one. And its time shifted version multiplies exponential minus j omega. When this input multiplies the capital H, we obtain the Fourier transform of output. And luckily in this problem, when we multiply capital X and capital H, one 
term in the denominator and the numerator cancel each other. What is left is a simpler expression of capital Y. Applying the previous result, we can obtain small y uh, from this capital Y, which is exponential series times U of N. And for uh, Fourier transform, if we know that the Fourier transform is well-defined, in other words, we know the Fourier transform exists, then we don't need to discuss over different ROCs right? because the Fourier transform in our lecture, it does not have convergences. But previously in the Laplace transform and Z transform, even when we know capital H, when we want to calculate small h, we need to discuss ROCs. So that's the difference between Laplace, Z, and Fourier transform. A question from the chat window. Uh, is difference equation special type of differential equation? I will not say that it's a special time differential equation because they are in different uh, variable domains. Uh, differential equation is in the continuous time domain. Uh, difference equation is in the discrete time domain. And they are two different things. Okay. So that is the Fourier transform for continuous time and discrete time. When we further specialize at the cases that we consider, in particular, when the, in the continuous time, when the signal X of T is periodic, it also has a Fourier transform, but the Fourier transform takes a very special format. For a periodic X of T, we can always find its fundamental period, capital T, and the fundamental frequency denoted by omega zero equals two pi divided by capital T. And it's a Fourier transform of capital X of J omega is a series of impulse functions in the omega axis. So remember that omega is a continuous variable. It is a continuous frequency. And small delta is the impulse function defined on the continuous variable domain. But on the continuous omega axis, the capital X of J omega is zero everywhere except at K times omega zero where an impulse occurs. And this series of impulse occurs for all the integers k. And for each impulse that occurs at k omega zero, its magnitude is uh, multiplied by two pi times a k, which is a constant coefficient. So that is the structure of Fourier transform for a periodic signal. And for a periodic signal, there is also Fourier series. Fourier series, in principle, it is different from Fourier transform because Fourier transform is an expression in omega domain, but Fourier series still express the signal in the time domain, in the T domain. That's why on the right-hand side, AK is constant coefficient that we can calculate in a certain way. Omega zero is a constant because it is the fundamental frequency of the signal. The only variable on the right-hand side is t. So it is still a function over t. Although those two concepts are different, there is a connection between them. That is, it's a infinite sum over k, and for each term, this constant a k appears. And there is a way to calculate a k from small x of t by taking this integration over any interval whose length is t. And when we try to apply this special case to the LTI system, of course, for periodic signal, the Fourier transform, this y j omega equals x j omega h j omega still holds. But we can also apply Fourier series to obtain output y of t directly in the time domain t without referring to the frequency domain omega. 
and the y of t has the same structure as the Fourier series x of t. So infinite sum a k exponential j k omega zero t, and the difference is that we insert a capital H of j k omega zero, and this capital H of j k omega zero, it is a constant that is obtained by replacing h of j omega with j k omega zero. H of j omega, we know that it was the Fourier transform of small h. But when we replace the omega with a particular k omega zero, we obtain a constant coefficient that only relies on the integer index k. So that is the structure of LTI system output when the input is periodic. And similarly, for discrete time signal, when x of a is periodic, we can also define Fourier series. It is very similar to the continuous time Fourier series. But the difference is that first we change from t to n. That's why on the right hand side, we also change from t to n. Second, for discrete time, the summation is not infinite. It is for any interval whose length is capital N, the fundamental period of small x of n. In general, we just take n uh, we just take from zero to capital N minus one. And the reason that we have finite sum here is because this family of exponentials, exponential j k omega zero n has repeated patterns for every capital N. I will show them in the slides of the uh, district kind Fourier transform chapter. And there is also a similar way to calculate the coefficients a k which is related to the summation of small x of n over any interval whose length is capital N. And for LTI system, besides the Fourier transform, which is still valid, we can also directly calculate y of n using the structure of Fourier series. The summation over the same index, ak the same, exponential jk omega zero n the same, just insert h of exponential jk omega zero, which is the Fourier transform h of exponential j omega, replacing omega with the particular k omega zero for integer index k and the fundamental frequency omega zero. But as you can see, the more general tool is the Fourier transform. Fourier series is just a special case, or it's just a special form for a special case of X. Therefore, the assessment for this course will be focused more on the Fourier transforms and their generalizations, Laplace and Z transforms. We've already calculated uh, Fourier series in the midterm, so it is not very likely that there will be a Fourier series again in the final exam. I said not very likely. I didn't uh, promise anything, but that's just uh, for yeah, just a guidance for you to prepare uh, over different parts of the course. So because of the time limitation, I didn't prepare uh, more slides. Uh, because you can always refer to the previous lecture slides for particular examples. Um, that's uh, basically the end of the final review. Now let me use a few minutes to emphasize several points in the final exam. So we've already done two online tests, uh, which is good because final exam will be the same format as our tests. It will happen next Wednesday, December 9th, uh, 3 to 5.30 PM. The final exam will count for 50% of your final grade. So uh, prepare for it. It is still open book, open notes, uh, including all the slides, homework, exercises, and their solutions. Uh, you can prepare a cheat sheet uh, for your quick reference. Again, no discussion, communication, no web browsing except Blackboard, 
no computation software. Same as before, you need two devices, one device to read the exam paper on Blackboard, the other device with camera on, uh, join Zoom so that the invigilators can see you. Uh, different from the test, because the two tests were held on Fridays, so we use the Friday like the Zoom meeting links for Friday lectures. Uh, ah. right. uh, let's use the same Zoom meeting uh, links uh, for the regular Wednesday lectures. Uh, make sure that you join the meeting with your real uh, name so that we can, we can make sure you participate in the exam. The first half an hour from 3 to 3.30 is the time for you to join the meeting, adjust your camera, and you will also receive invitation to break out room, same as before, please accept those invitations. The exam will formally start at 3.30, then exam paper will become available on Blackboard under the course content. You will have two hours for the exam. The only after 5.15, you can leave Zoom because at this time you might need your camera to take photos of your solutions. And you have 15 minutes to upload answers. At 5.30, you should finish uploading because assignment due is at that time exam ends. Same as before, we do not accept late submission. Uh, it is two hours, two hours. And understand that you may occasionally uh, get offline because of network issues. So there is some a great time for you to leave the video, but you must be make sure that you are on the video for more than 90 minutes. Otherwise your points will be subtracted. If you are on the video less than 75 minutes, you will be deemed uh, in, uh, not invigilated and you will get 10 point, uh, zero points. Uh, the same instructions for uh, how to adjust your camera here. And yeah, this is for the breakout room. And again, in case of emergency like uh, poor network connection, other reasons you cannot join the exam, uh, please uh, contact either me or the TA, Mr. Xu Ke, according to your student ID number. Hey. So that is end of today's lecture and also all the lectures that are taught by me. On Fridays, as I said, starting from 9.30, there will be two tutorials, each 45 minutes uh, given by the two TAs. They will review the relevant questions, problems. Uh, hope they, it, it will be helpful for preparation of your final exam. Uh, well, thanks for your cooperation, attention, and all the efforts made during this special semester where when we can only communicate online. Also, I appreciate all your uh, questions, comments, uh, feedbacks that were very precious for us to improve our teaching. Mm, I will see you again next Wednesday during the final exam. Uh, please keep healthy and uh, protected from COVID-19. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.